Being Black in America comes with its challenges. However, we understand that enlightenment through education is the oppressor's worst fear. By bridging the gap between academia and the people, our purpose is to equip you with knowledge that breaks down barriers during your journey towards truth and freedom. Welcome to the Black and Highly Dangerous Podcast. Yeah, Dev, what's up? What's up? How's your week been? What's been going on? You know, my week has been good. You know, fully have transitioned back into work, trying to figure out how I am going to end this year really strong. Um, part of ending it strong is also taking care of myself. So as always, I, I really have been taking the weekends off. So, you know, resting, binging a little TV or binging the Internet. That was my thing this week. Just keeping up with what's going on online. Um, how about you? Yeah, similar. Um, trying winding down. I got one more, pa- one more set of papers to grade, and then um, hand those final grades in this week. A couple last minute meetings. Uh, this past week was a bit hectic because we were um, having a search um, in our department for a new position, and um, this is the first time all of the entire search uh, was virtual. Um, and so, because all the candidates came in virtual. You pretty much had a search, uh, almost, you know, an interview almost every day uh, this week. And like, I didn't think it was going to be so taxing, but it was. Because um, again, I know it definitely is taxing for the candidates because it's almost a whole day event for them. But it's also a whole day event for the faculty as well. Um, and so doing that in consecutive days when you have to like grade papers and trying to work on grant, all that other kind of stuff. It was just like, oh, I didn't have time. For much, um, so that was a pretty hectic week, but it's all done. Um, candidates, you know, interviews, everything went well, and so now uh, I can finish out this semester uh, moving forward. But like you, you know, I'm thinking about um, how I want to really, really, I think this will be the first year I would say I'm really going to like sit down and like plan. Um, and I know we could talk about this probably more so in a couple of weeks, but you know, plan my 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 2022. Um, and I like that idea that you mentioned. And that may be something I probably would be more intentional about implementing is like getting my work done during the week and then really just saying, you know, during the weekend, I'm not doing no work <laughs> and just like enjoying the weekends. Cause I think sometimes as academics, we tend to work on the weekends where most folks who have, you know, nine to fives don't do that and they get to relax. And I think we have to be more intentional about that. And I think that would really help balance out, you know, my, just everything when it comes to, to, to working and trying to stay balanced. Yeah. It's so interesting because I feel like, it has been a process of going back to saying it's OK to take off, like not feeling guilty that like, yes, yeah, it's, it's Saturday and I didn't do anything because I've become so accustomed to working. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, it's actually normal to not work and <laughs> be OK with that, Daphne, like stop planning work anyway to just make yourself feel bad. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so I think I'm really going to stick to that Monday through Friday and just you know what? It's okay, like you said. It's hard. Sometimes it's hard. It's hard to be like, oh, I should, I should be doing this, and I got this to do. But it could wait till Monday. It could wait. Um, so yeah, I like that. I like that strategy. Um, but okay, uh, for our listeners, you know, this week we'll be doing some current events, uh, talking about some things. A lot kind of has transpired over the past couple of weeks um, as we get ready to head into the holidays and. Probably next week we'll update you on our holiday plans like we always do every year. Um, But we wanted to take the time to, you know, dedicate some space to a lot of um, uh, items that has happened this past week and two um, that we think are worthy of discussing. Um, So before that, we'll get to some old Lord news and talk about some more uh, of the serious news items that took place. Hello and welcome to BHD News, where we give you the most current and eye opening old Lord news of the week. Join us as we present news that'll make you want to say. Okay, so one wacky story that I came across this week, uh, and it, it was so unbelievable in many ways, but a mother, a 48 year old mother, spent two years living as her estranged 22-year-old daughter. Wow. 
She stole her ID to secure loans, get a driver's license, enroll in university, and even dated guys who uh, supposedly believed she was 22 years old. Now, y'all, when when I want, when y'all hear this, I want y'all to Google Laura Oglesby. Oglesby. <laughs> What a name. <laughs> uh, and you will see. Uh, I don't know what's wrong with those people because there's no way this 48 year old woman convinced people that she was 22. <laughs> they must have been awesome. Because <laughs> <laughs> Ain't no way. Uh, but it's funny. She took over her daughter's life and is now, you know, she pled guilty to social security fraud and faces up to five years in prison after she and also, you know, embezzled money uh, to go to school. So. Mm, yeah, that's I guess that's one way to live vicariously through, through your children. Child, actually just take over their identity. <laughs> take their identity and live the life you always wanted to live using their name and age. But that's funny. Yeah, that's a big age gap. So I'm, I'm sure that, you know, folks probably just chose not to see the truth in those situations if they interacted with her believing that she was 22 years old. Yeah, um, that's funny. Yes. Okay. So I want to know what you think about this. Uh, in California, we know that they are, we have often framed them as, you know, kind of, you know, beacons of what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, California school districts have recently decided to eliminate D and F as grades in an attempt to re-engage students amid floundering test scores during the pandemic. What do you think about that? Oh, that's that's interesting. Um, I want to say that I think I think that can be useful um, in K through uh, twelve because again we know there's a lot of inequities within the education system, and I think I can see how when kids see D's and F's, um, it may be disheartening and disappointing, and they may not be they may be like oh I'm not I'm not going to try anymore. Um, and kind of withdraw from school and education. Um, but then I don't know. I don't know. It just, then it's just like in the entire system. I know, I know already like a lot of schools in LA, I don't think they take like SAT scores or like GREs. I think they, some have been pretty progressive about that too. So maybe it's not a big factor. They just look at everything else. Um, so what C would be the lowest grade you would get. I don't know. I guess I'll have to look more to it. I don't think I'm fully against it, but I think, um, I know that could probably be frustrating for teachers. Mm -hmm. What kind of message that send? Because now if kids can be like, oh, I'm just not going to do, I know the fear is like kids will be just like, oh, I'm not doing any work and I can still get a C if I don't hand in anything, um, which I know isn't, you know, the proper, it, and it does, it's not fully, um, uh, it doesn't fully demonstrate like the, what the kid's effort is putting in or, or how they're performing. Um, but I do think maybe getting away from the DNF and having maybe unsatisfactory and, you know, must need some more resources, need some more help before we can pass you and not being an F. I think there are other ways, I think for sure that we can start to look at, um, but maybe not completely eliminating, but yeah, just look at alternatives yeah. to identify stuff like that. So what they'll be offering is like, if students like fail an assignment or an exam, the opportunity to retake or later come, you know, turn in the work. Um, if they do not, then they would be offered incompletes. Okay. Okay. I can see that. I can see that. I think it could be, I wonder how educators feel about that. Cause I feel like it might be a little more work. Um, but I can also see, you know, we're supposed to put the children first and when you get an F, I mean, what it, I mean, it does say, right. Like you said, it says failure, like you failed. Um, and I think, yeah, saying it incomplete or saying, you know, need more time, need more assistance is definitely better more motivation and more encouraging than saying you're a failure. So, yeah, I, I just wonder how it works, because in high school, you, you know, you move on. It's not like you have the same teacher all year long. Like, what if you go into the summer without it? Like, is the teacher expected to like go back and potentially like grade a bunch of students work from last year and they have work from this year. So I'm just wondering how it works logistically and I'm not against it, but it sounds like uh, as you're doing this, you probably need to also focus on paying teachers more because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this is, this is more work. Mm -hmm. Yep. Like I said, that's my biggest concern with this. It just sounds like there's more responsibility already put on these teachers who already have a lot of responsibility. And that's how it is in um, a lot of college. I know my college is, yeah, you have, if I gave a student an incomplete, I have a certain deadline, not 
during the summer, but by the next semester, it'll be like a month and a half into the next semester Mm -hmm. that I have to upgrade that grade. Uh, But we're not expected to do it over the summer. So if we choose to, we still got some time um, in the, in the next semester. Uh, But it's still, I don't, that's one reason I never, I only give out, you know, my seven, seven years being at New Paltz, I only give out one incomplete. Like it's something that I don't want to do because I'm just like, it's just mad extra work and paperwork and things we got to fill out and grade stuff later. Um, so I can definitely see with teachers that have to do it almost all the time. It's, it's just, yeah. And with the potential lot of students, I know for me, I've only taught one class on my own at the higher education level. And I already, I can already see, I wouldn't be given like multiple people incomplete. That's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. It would have to be some like really extenuating circumstances. And Mm -hmm. it's something that I actually was willing to do, but it's just like, "Mm -hmm." Yeah. If half the class would either earn below a C or need an incomplete, it's just like, how do you handle that? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I do. Yeah, I couldn't do it. As I think about this class, this freshman class I just taught this semester, and there were definitely a lot of C's and D's in this class. And there's no way I'm about to be doing all these <laughs> incompletes. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna just take a take a semester off, and somebody else can handle this till I get back. <laughs> if right, I had to do that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I have another story to see how you feel about this. So uh, there at a, re- a restaurant in Arkansas had been a part of the one hundred dollar dinner club, uh, which is this policy is not is an informal policy where guests who are dining at the restaurant decide to leave a hundred dollar tip as a way of paying it forward. Mm-hmm. Um, so one group of guests actually decided to get together and raise four thousand and four hundred dollars to give to some lucky server. Mm. So here's where the issue came in. The server who received it was fired for not pulling the tips. So for not splitting mm-hmm. it with all the other co-workers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, th- this worker's rationale was that they had never been asked to do that before. Oh, OK. OK. So, you know, what do you think? Should the person uh, have split the tips? Was it an unreasonable ask for from the restaurant? to like ask the server to like split this. And what ended up happening is actually when the guests found out about the person maybe having to like split the big tip, they actually walked outside of the restaurant. Like he asked the server to walk outside so that he could give the money to her like outright. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, one, I mean, every restaurant has their own culture and kind of informal policies. And I've seen folks and known folks who worked in that industry. And yeah, it's different. Um, sometimes some places they do split. Um, most of the time, folks do split some with the the chef, um, mm-hmm. the people cooking in the back. Right? Bartenders I think that's, as mm-hmm, well. And bartenders, rightfully so. Like they're the ones making the drinks and making the food. And so uh, if you get a nice tip, you'll, you'll, you'll cut some off to them. Uh, but splitting to the entire like staff, um, I that is I I rarely hear have heard that um, unless it's like one of those things where it's like a um, I don't know like a, a pail or a bucket you know putting getting put it into one they split it at the end of the night but again that's typical at bars and then like if they never did that <laughs> if they've never been asked to do that then yeah you can't actually implement a policy now um, uh, to to give it to everyone if folks have been getting a hundred dollars and you haven't been asking folks to split that hundred dollars with everyone. Then yes, when somebody gets four thousand dollars, you can't. You gotta uphold that same policy. And I think it's unfair to fire someone <laughs> by you know following kind of the status quo of what's already been set. So yeah, um, yeah that's, it's messed up. It's messed up. It's one thing if they've always done that and he was like, nah, I'm not gonna do it. Um, but if they never done it, then hey, it's following protocol. So you gotta let that one slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I agree, uh, but the. After she was fired, those same people ended up setting up a GoFundMe. I think she got a new job. So, and the restaurant has been flooded with really negative uh, comments and reviews. I bet, yeah. <laughs> I, bet, I bet, I bet. Let them, let them people bless that that one uh, a waitress, man. Let them, let them live. Always trying to be greedy, um, especially if if the the norm is that everyone gets a hundred dollar tip for the most part. 
Um, that means, you know, most of, most of the staff there probably doing pretty well compared to other establishments. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Shouldn't be that thirsty. Yeah. So, okay, I got one more story before I pass it over to you. Although I have other stories I might share throughout. So mm-hmm. did you hear about your boy, Kanye West, and his publicist? Oh, no, I don't think I heard about that. Okay. So we all know that uh, Kanye West has been a huge fan of Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, it has recently emerged that a publicist who worked for Kanye West reportedly made a trip to Georgia after the 2020 presidential election and tried to pressure an election worker into confessing uh, to unfounded claims of fraud. And like this is even on video, um, like some of the videos seems to like the person seems to be suggesting like indirectly that like they work for an important person and like this is important to your safety, you know, for you, like for this person to like, Mm -mm. you know, claim that there were these uh, fraud allegations. Mm -hmm. That's wild. See, see, and people still out here bumping this Kanye, man. (laughs) And you got your staff out here doing like doing, doing stuff like this, uh, going to bat for somebody like Donald Trump. Is is a bit wild. No, that's crazy. I don't even know why a publicist would do that. Like this is that's not that's like outside uh, the realm of responsibilities. Uh, you're supposed to just make sure your artist and your client is doing fine, not worry about what's happening with politics or the president. Um, that's not even you know anybody that you work for. So that's that's just dumb. But yeah, I'm not I, I'm not surprised. Much things about Kanye don't surprise me. Yeah, uh, these, these days. It's you know it's he. I think people, maybe after Trump got out of office, I think people were slowly like, okay, I guess we can warm back up to Kanye. But, and I I thought about it for a split second. And then like this comes to light. The person was like, I'm a crisis manager, told uh, told this election worker that, you know, she was in danger and that she had 48 hours before unknown subjects arrived at her home. Like, I can't say specifically what will take place. Uh, I just know that it will disrupt your freedom. And wow. it's kind of like, y'all are ill. Mm, 100. No other way No other way to say it. Um, that's just some wild stuff right there. And the only news I heard about Kanye this past week was um, him him on stage with Drake. And he was like, you know, at some point pleading to get Kim back. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then a, a day or so later, Kim um, hit him with, you know, some paperwork talking about, nah, you know, this is done. I want to be officially be single because uh, I know, you know, you know, she's been out here running around with Pete Davidson. Yeah, I heard that. I heard <laughs> that. <laughs> like, boy, people move fast, man. People move fast. Um, but yeah, so, but yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Not one bit. Oh, um, a couple stories I can share. One, I know, you know, I've been kind of, and I think, and also it's because I've been following a lot more like business uh, platforms on social media. And for some reason, they just, they post a lot of techie stuff. Um, there's a lot of overlap between like tech world and, and business anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, this past week, uh, Elon Musk and his company um, said that they plan to, or they're confident that they're going to begin testing um, a chip in humans next year. Um, this This company... Uh, is creating a chip known as the Neuralink. Mm-hmm. Um, and they plan to, it's a chip that you uh, will allegedly put into the brains of humans. And it's supposed to essentially try to eventually, the ultimate goal is to like do- download your consciousness is the goal. Oh my um, goodness. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. This is some Black Mirror stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This chip, the first, the first kind of prototype of the chip is first is to get you to be able to interact with computers um, using your brain. So you put the chip in the brain, and you can have the computer like run and do certain tasks. Um, you know, kind of like you see in that sci-fi stuff where you're connected to a device in your brain, and then eventually their ultimate goal is to be able to download consciousness. You know, years and years down the line. Uh, but this is the beginnings of it. Something that Elon Musk has been talking about for years, and now they would hope they're hoping to test it on folks starting next year. Oh I know goodness. I won't be one of those test subjects, but <laughs> so thinking about that, 
with the rise of this metaverse, people people gonna be wasting away in their homes. Oh man, it's, it's people it's, gonna it's, stop eating because they're gonna be eating virtual food and stuff. Like, oh my goodness, it's gonna, it's be, gonna be it's gonna be wild. It's gonna be wild. Um, I saw a couple like uh, little prototypes of these metaverse and VR things. And actually, one of them was pretty interesting because I know the um, the perception is that yeah, folks will be wasting away, but then. Some folks are saying that it can be used to stimulate, you know, um, being active and things like that. Because they, this one device, they kind of put you in kind of this, you're, you're kind of surrounded in like this circular treadmill, if you will. And so the guys were like playing the game and it allows you, it straps you in. But they were like, I guess with some kind of zombie game or something like that. So they were like shooting, but they were literally running. Um, and as they're running on the treadmill, it's running in the game. Um, and so they were like running and dipping and like sprinting away and then stopping and running and sprinting away. And so, uh, folks are saying, you know, there's also uh, a bit of it where you don't have to just kind of sit and you can be, you know, active if they incorporate multiple devices like this treadmill along with the metaverse and things like that. Um, but we'll see, you know, uh, we all seen the movies and typically nothing, (laughs) nothing positive usually comes out when this stuff is on a mass scale. Um, and we're still a few years away. Um, probably 10 or so years, but it is, we're, we're definitely getting to that point where it's the very beginnings of it. And it's only going to, to expand from here. Man, that is interesting. I'll be watching. I'm, I'm a late adapter when it comes to technology anyway. So I'll be watching as y'all fry y'all brains. Oh yeah. I definitely ain't putting nothing in my brain. (laughs) Be super late for that. (laughs) Sure. Glasses, things like that. Sure. I'll, I'll test that at some point, but Things going to my body, computer chips and things. Nah, I'm not, not fully trusting that. Um, but, you know, I do hope that some positive things come out of this technology stuff. Like, um, I know last week we talked about the the robotic cells and things like that and, and reading more about it. You know, some folks hope that this can lead into um, the creation of like organs and stuff. Mm. Um, and I think stuff like that, definitely, like when we talk about the health implications and the curing certain things, giving people, you know, body parts so you don't have to wait for someone to die or be on a list definitely would be um, would be great um, having having us be able to supplement that kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. there can be some positives. And I think in the health world, we'll see some of that overlap and transition over to. But, yes, the, the social life aspect definitely is something to worry about. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, speaking of technology, too, I think I just want folks to know this. Um you know, for those of you who don't know, Apple has this thing called Apple AirTags. Have you heard of those, Dav? Yes. I think you did a story about it not too long ago, right? Oh, yeah, because the guys was, uh, like, robbed somebody, was able to track them and rob them. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. So, um, a police report in Canada and some police precincts in the U.S. have begun to warn consumers about this uh, with carjackings. So, essentially, uh, what these folks are doing is putting... They'll be at a mall or wherever, um, and they'll, you know, they'll watch you get out your car. You're going to the mall. They will place the air tag somewhere in your car that you can't see underneath it, and then they will track you <laughs> until you get home. And then they've been um, stealing people's cars mm-hmm. at night, um, and they've been typically they've been doing it usually with newer cars, with all because you know a lot of new cars have a uh, very uh, very much computerized, mm-hmm. and so they 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 kind of hack the system. And set the car's settings back to like factory reset and it allows them to get access and pretty much drive away very easily without having, you know, to set off the alarms and do all the kind wow. of old school using the weapons. I, yes. People are so smart. It's like, yes. oh my goodness, can you use that to start a business instead of robbing people? <laughs> I, know. I know using that, um, using that it would be helpful, right? In so many different ways. And so um, folks have actually begin, begun to complain with Apple saying, hey, y'all should, you know, reconsider or put some warnings out with this device because it's essentially supposed to be used to find your keys like you mentioned that story a while back uh but of course you know people gonna find and be innovative and use it for different ways and this is robin season y'all um which just means that during the holidays crime upticks a lot uh, a lot of robberies a lot of theft as folks are trying to either make money or give their family christmas gifts and if you look like a, a target um, you know, they're going to be creative and trying to get stuff. So something to keep, keep, you know, be, be on your P's and Q's about. I know I was telling Christian about that too. Just, Hey, be careful when you're out here shopping and doing things. Cause you just never know. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because you mentioned that I, I had, I hadn't heard anything about the carjacking, but 
there have been more stories since that original. Um, it was kind of like a, a, a gang war story. That one in particular, mm-hmm. they were, you know, it was very targeted um, hit, I guess you could say. But I have seen an growing number of stories just in general. Um, I think there have been like women that have reported like being in their car. Because the thing is, if you have an iPhone, it will let you know like there's, you know, a tracker or what was the name of it again? The uh, Apple AirTag. Yeah, they were like, they will let it will, you'll get a notification like there's an AirTag in your vicinity. And so there like have been like a few women who have you know, ended up going to the police station and like reporting to police, you know, after they left a, you know, public shopping area or et cetera, they got a notification on their phone that there was an air tag uh, following mm. them. And mm. who knows what would that would be about? Maybe it was about like maybe taking their car later. Maybe it was about something else. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, make sure your phone updated too, y'all, if you got an iPhone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah. yeah, Apple needs to rethink that. Yeah, I see the idea. I see the idea. But when you have a team like this, I think this is why it's important to um, have a diverse, uh, uh, I guess, decision makers up there. Because, yes, you're going to have folks on the tech side, the marketing side, business side. Oh, this is a great idea. But you're going to need folks who will think about the social ramifications of these Mm -hmm. kind of things and be like, uh, Hey, if we do this, you know, this can be used in in several different ways. It's not going to be just used for the keys. And we need to consider that and make sure we have either some um, safe safety features on there or something that protects people. And like you said, it can be very scary because, yes, people can use this outside of just trying to rob you um, if they're trying to follow you Mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff, which we know there's a lot of sick people out here that do that kind of stuff. So got to be careful. So, yeah, update your phone. Definitely you got an iPhone because if it lets you know that's something you would want to pay attention to if that starts to to give you those kind of alerts. Yes. If you have an iPhone, it will let you know if there's an air tag uh, following you. That's good. That's good to know. Um, and speaking of crime, I'll pass it back to you. So we get to a couple other stories. Um, the LAPD oh, <clears throat> union <yeah>. leader <laughs> <laughs> pretty much um, has been telling tourists that, hey, uh, he literally said, we can't guarantee your safety and has um, said that kind of he actually compared to what's been going on to the purge. He said, we can't guarantee your safety. It's really, really out of control. I said it to people before. It's like the movie Purge. You know, instead of 24 hours to commit your crime, these people have 365 days to commit whatever they want. Um, he says that crimes are going rampant in the southern part of California, around L.A. Um, and a lot of these uh, victims were hit. Uh, with this big robbery, armed robbery at the Intercontinental Hotel, downtown, etc. So it's a lot of crime happening. Again, I think the police union uh, leader, whoever he is, you know, I think he's overstating a little bit. Crime always peaks uh, between uh, Thanksgiving and, and the new year um, just because there's a lot of opportunity. Um, and so, yes, people need to be on their P's and Q's. It's definitely something people need to be concerned about and worried about. But it's it's looking at crime trends. It's 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 a normal pattern. Yeah, I was about to say I did come across that story and, you know, I ended up, you know, reading a discussion about it from people in California And some of the comments was, yeah, there's an incentive for like the police union to say this because they want more funding. They want more money. So there is this incentive for them to say that. So just putting that out there. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. But before he even said that. So I have a very good friend from graduate school who, you know, is from California. You know, before we went to Harvard together, he went to Berkeley, like all of and. He was actually, he, he works uh, in tech and he's like, I don't want to move back to California because all of these things have been happening. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I have also been hearing this from people on the ground. Uh, one of the things that he mentioned is that uh, it has a lot of this has been happening in like very wealthy areas. So, mm-hmm. for instance, like it might be like a really upscale restaurant and somebody comes in and robs everybody in the restaurant. Mm-hmm. And he said that there's been like a lot of cases like that. So, yes, there is an incentive for police to put this story out here. But if you actually talk to people who are living there, which I have, and, and like you said, it might be related to the holidays. 
is also related to, I mean, we're still in a pandemic. Inflation is at its highest. You know, that was one of the stories I actually had, like, you know, Biden's approval rating related to handling inflation is like really low. Only 69% of people actually approve of how he has been handling inflation. Only 57% um, or 69% disapprove of how he's handled inflation. 57% disapprove of how he's handled the economic recovery you know, as student loans are about to like uh, come back in our lives. Mm-hmm, I've been getting these mm-hmm. emails like people are stressed about finances and it's not to give an excuse to anyone. But if people if there was a little bit more economic equality, I, I'm not saying that crime would 100 percent disappear, but maybe we wouldn't be at this point. A hundred percent. You hit it right on the nail. Uh, there's this uh, <clears throat> term um, that uh, we, it's, it's been discussed in psychology and stuff like that too, but in criminology, uh, relative deprivation um, mm-hmm. with John Braithwaite. And essentially this just means it because you mentioned it happens in wealthy areas and um, the underlying you know foundation, the point, the theme of that theory is just saying that when Folks who are extremely poor live close to folks who are extremely wealthy. Uh, we see crime increase mm-hmm. um, when there's close proximity. So, yes, we know that L.A., place of the rich, the movie stars, the athletes, all that wonderful stuff. We've seen the stories of the music artists, everybody getting robbed um, in their homes, right? They're massive targets. And I think it's because this gap that we already knew about is becoming more extreme, more apparent especially so now we know folks have these wonderful cars and all these wonderful clothes and, and lifestyles and I'm living here where my family is struggling now I'm, I'm gonna go out and make sure my family can eat too and you're an easy target um, and so you're right because there's not there's so much inequity when we talk about uh, wealth and and income and living in close proximity it, 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 it exacerbates those temptations of, of being able to commit because it's right in front of you and you're either frustrated, you're angry, or you're jealous, or you're just hungry. And so you, now you have an opportunity to make some money. And so I think I think you're definitely right, Dev. Particularly, like you said, it's happening really in the wealthy areas um, for that reason. And I think, you know, this is just a good example of that theory kind of looking what it looks like in real life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's like, be careful out here, y'all. I, I won't lie. I take the train when I can. That's not going to save me. But in big cities in general, over the course of the pandemic, there have been, you know, news of like increasing carjackings and stuff like that. So I will say it has shaped like just the way I operate if I don't have to drive anywhere. Not saying that I'm afraid on a daily basis that I'm going to get carjacked, but it's just kind of like a, you know, I just, you know, I, I just be on alert. I just put it like yeah. that. Yep. And then if, if anybody got a, um, a ring camera like I do, <laughs> that doing, on the ring, uh, when you download the app, it's like a, it's almost like a social media app. So people will, report and post videos of things that are happening in, you know, close proximity, maybe within five to 10 miles. And I would say that like every day, it's just um, somebody trying to get into my car, somebody trying to get in my car, somebody trying to check my car doors. Like that's been the biggest one um, that's been coming up on these alerts from like, you know, all, all the folks around. So, so yeah, this car vehicle thefts a big thing. It makes sense. People checking the cars to see if there are any gifts or any goodies back there. And it's common because sometimes parents will wait for the kids to they'll buy something and not want to bring it in the house and, you know, wait for the kids to kind of go to sleep or something before they try to go out and bring it in. And so, you know, there can be a lot of nice items in these in these cars. So mm-hmm. be careful, y'all. Mm-hmm. Moral story. Uh, be on your P's and Q's, uh, especially during this holiday season. Yeah. Another reason that you need to be careful in the car is that people are on edge. There was a story, uh, Arizona mom uh, was driving in the car with her husband and her daughter, who was eight months pregnant at a red light. I guess she wanted to turn right. Um, there was a car in front of her. So she, you know, did the, the honking um, and ended up like just going around the car in front of her. Mm -hmm. The car that she passed and honked at eventually caught up with her and like emptied a clip into the car. Oh, wow. And killed, you know, she ended up crashing. The mom died. The other people in the car were okay. But, uh, oh, wow. Yeah. Goodness gracious, man. I just never, that road rage stuff is crazy. Um, 
And yeah, and, and I don't know, you know, the specific statistics, but I know in these states that are making it very easy to carry stuff like that is common. Um, or, or more common. I, you know, I have family that lives in Georgia and all this kind of stuff that moved from this area, you know, New York, New Jersey, these areas, people honk on the horns all the time. Yes. Um, but they said when they went down <laughs> south, they said, ah, uh-uh, they, uh, they really, they really fell back on honking the horns, uh, <laughs> because of reasons like that. Uh, because folks are more likely to have weapons on them and carry it and if catch the wrong person, it could end tragically like that. And it's just, it's just silly, man. Yeah. Be mad. People get frustrated. Do what normal people do. Flip the bird, <laughs> use some profane words, get it out your system, <laughs> and keep it moving. You don't got to shoot anybody, man. It ain't that serious. Yes, that's the normal <laughs> thing. I, I won't lie. I remember when I used to live in Atlanta. I used in that car. Yo, some <laughs> stuff used to fly out of my mouth. But I, honestly, when I really think about what was happening on the road, you know, especially rough rush hour traffic, coming home from work. I think we were all just frustrated and we were releasing mm-hmm. our frustrations with work out on each other. So, you know, we flipping <laughs> a bird, you a bee, you a this, you a that. And it's just like, maybe after all that yelling, you felt a little better. I don't know. But yeah. I started playing gospel music in the car because I, I felt <laughs> a little bad about cursing and stuff. And it, it, it did keep me calm. And and mm-hmm. now, because I did, I remember when I first moved to Philly, and like I like humped a hunt. I was like, don't you, uh, don't play. <laughs> you don't know these people. So now I, you know, I'm not playing gospel music, but I keep it in the car. Like, yeah, what, yeah. That's what the, were that's you thinking? Way. Like, I, I'm having conversations with the drivers, but I'm, <laughs> they don't know I'm having those conversations because I don't know. Yeah. No, that's funny. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. That's you gotta find those coping me- mechanisms to keep it. You know. Keep it, uh, keep it inside, cause otherwise, yeah, release it, but don't. We don't want it to escalate to anything crazy. Absolutely. And like you said, folks on edge, so even more so now, probably than than ever before. Mm-hmm. It's important. Mm-hmm. That's what I just mind my business. I go about my business. You might get a smile and a little. Well, you can't even see my smile under my mask, cause now <laughs> now it's cold, and I just like to keep yeah. the mask on, just cause it keeps my face warm outside. So yeah. That is true. With these masks on, sometimes um, it is weird. I have to rem- remember that because I'll, you know, I'll be walking. I'll see somebody looking at me. So sometimes you try to give a little smile of hello. I'm like, oh, man, they can't even they can't even see it. So sometimes I try to like try to practice my smiles. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Do that smile. Yeah. So, yeah. So they can see it in my eyes. Uh, but yeah, it is. That has made it more challenging to look, you know, a little more friendly or give friendly gestures with your face when you have these masks on. Yep. 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 Um, did you have any other stories? Um, yeah, if, if you don't have any um, other ones, I saw this one uh, quick one about the FDA approves eye drops that can temporarily improve blurred vision. Oh. Um, yeah, it says that uh, it improves declining vision in middle aged groups of people. Um, so in October, they approved this potential replacement instead of reading glasses. And so you put simply drop it in your eyes and improve improves ver- improve, improves blurred vision, um, and it's called Vuity, uh, V U I T Y, and it works in just fifteen minutes after application. Oh, um, yeah. So and it said it can keep sharper vision for up to ten hours. Um, so that that was pretty interesting. Uh, it was I think seven hundred and fifty people participated in the clinical trial, and I guess the FDA saw enough results where they feel like it's good enough to put out on mass scale. Um, so I thought this might be something interesting for folks who, you know, might be driving or sometimes I know folks want to take pictures and don't want to wear glasses or put in contacts and things like that for those short stints. If you just throw in, um, and I'm pretty sure, I don't, I don't know how type of vision, but probably for mild, you know, folks who might need, uh, reading glasses for mild, uh, mild vision problems. It probably works best. Um, but just throwing that out there too, for folks who may have these kind of issues and looking for a different alternative this is hitting the market soon child i'm i'm a negative four so it ain't gonna work for me <laughs> yeah i i use my reading glasses on and off um but every time i go they say i don't need them but sometimes i just feel like oh i'm looking at these screens all the time especially this past year and a half teaching online and stuff like that i've i've used i haven't used them in a little while because we've been teaching in person um but i was like ah, let me let me just use them just in case because i don't want my eyes struggling straining we don't have to be mm-hmm. staring at the screen nowadays is not it's not fun yeah 
I feel you. I feel you. Well, one story, this is a quick one. You know, we were talking about like trademarks and the importance of like getting permission for you using mm-hmm. them, et cetera. Well, that uh, conversation has recently come back into uh, the forefront because, uh, you know, Sex in the City did a reboot. Mm, yeah, I watched the first episode. Okay. Spoiler <laughs> alert, y'all. Spoiler <laughs> alert. Yes, please pat, fast forward if you don't want to hear hear this. <laughs> okay, so you know what happened. Big was mm-hmm. uh, exercising on Peloton, which yeah. it seems like they had permission, but they didn't know how Peloton would be used. Mm-hmm. And he died. Uh, <laughs> well, he yeah. had a heart attack, and yeah. the stock fell. Mm. <laughs> That's funny. Yes, the stock that dropped after that first episode. Now I still love my Peloton, so you know. But it's interesting. This is why it's so important not only to get permission, but to probably also know how your brand is going to be used. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should say, yeah, that should, should be the question. Like, oh, yeah, because I think, you know, I can see why they're rushing to do, oh, yes, for sure, approve that. I mean, it's Sex in the City. Everyone's going to watch it, especially the first episode. Great marketing. Um, but, yeah, now that because of that mass appeal and the way it was used, it actually can be detrimental to your stock. And I saw Peloton re- put out a statement saying, hey, this does not, you know, <laughs> cause this kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I just like, man, this is too funny how, how this kind of stuff just influences and affects the entire company, that one scene. Yeah. And I mean, they were already being impacted by, I think, you know, a slump in sales and some stuff. Mm-hmm. So they were already having issues anyway. But to see that sock shock. Yeah. 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 No, I agree. Um, and I, that's why I didn't watch the second episode. Yeah. I was like, oh, no, nah, that's y'all going to do this in the first one. I said, no, nah, I don't know. So I'm still debating if I'm going to continue. I know Chris has been watching it. I mean, that's that like Game of Thrones, like shock Mm -hmm. you, like, which Mm -hmm. can make a series more interesting. But I feel like people were watching it for nostalgia's sake. I don't don't think they're looking for uh, some like amazing, like really new storylines. I think they wanted to see like these old storylines play out. In the new world. Mm -hmm. That's why I like where they were kind of going with it. Um, and reach into talking about that demographic and the new kind of issues in this age. And yeah, they definitely do that big old wrench. I'm like, ah, we'll see. Um, we'll see how the show go does because of that. But I know, you know, he was a, he was a fan fave and their relationship of course was. So, you know, you know, I feel like you shouldn't, yeah, starting out a series like that, just on such a depressing note, mm-hmm. <laughs> ain't the, probably the best way to go, especially because folks are so excited that you're coming back. So we'll see. Yeah. We shall see. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so on some bigger stories, um, over this past weekend, uh, a number of states were impacted by a December tornado outbreak. Uh, it was Illinois, Kentucky, uh, and Tennessee, uh, primarily, I think also maybe was it Arkansas that was Mm -hmm. impacted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, wow, it's so sad, you know, just before Christmas that uh, some states are now declaring uh, or cities are declaring like a state of emergency. There was the Amazon warehouse, I think, that collapsed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, There have been like, I think, upwards of like 70 deaths. Yep. And they're estimating maybe it might get to 100. Mm. Yeah. I saw, yeah, I saw the images. I mean, one, I mean, I know you got family in Tennessee and stuff like that and friends where everybody okay out there on your end. Yeah, it didn't, yes, it didn't impact the, uh, like major areas where I have family. Although of course it, it did start to almost move closer to Nashville. I think Mount Juliet, they didn't get the tornadoes, but it was like really bad winds and stuff like that. And uh, mm-hmm. people might have sustained minor damage. But like that's the area that was just impacted by a tornado in March 2020. Mm. You know, seeing those images and just seeing how nature can nature. <laughs> um, I mean, those those powerful storms, those big tornadoes, things like you see off movies. 
and seeing them happen in succession in multiple areas, the damage that was done afterwards. I mean, it's really, really scary images, man. And, and the lives that are lost because of this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think we're just hitting, we're moving into this age of some really scary weather events mm -hmm. um, because of things like climate change. And um, it's really important to think about this kind of stuff. Um, one, yes, to do our part to reverse it. But I'm sure it's just like, man, we're like, you're thinking about places you want to live and settle. And yes. yeah, I mean, it's like, no, for it, real. You got to consider this. You got to consider this kind of stuff now. As you know, it have it has always been a dream of mine to move back home to Tennessee. And what was mm -hmm. interesting in Chattanooga growing up, there was always this kind of myth around us that like, oh, tornadoes don't happen in, in Chattanooga because like we are in the valley and we're like protected. And it was, I think, two years ago, the first tornado in my entire life that I have ever heard of in the Chattanooga area actually happened. It happened in this mm. little suburb outside of Chattanooga called Ottawa. Uh, but mm -hmm. there was a lot of damage and that's scary because I'm like, I grew up my whole life thinking that Chattanooga was this perfect place in terms mm -hmm. of weather. And, mm -hmm. you know, Nashville is where I went to college and like, it's always been a dream for me to go back. It was like, Lord, if I ever moved there, like I can't move there without a basement because that's about yeah. the safest place you can be during a mm -hmm. tornado. Of course, there's no guarantees. You got to make sure like, you aren't like below like a refrigerator and stuff while you're in the bay. But like these mm -hmm. are the types of things that I am now looking up. Like how to stay safe during the tornado. Yeah. No, it's real. It's real. Um, even being in the Northeast, uh, you know, hurricanes, we always knew hurricanes came and went, but by the time they came up here because it was always generally cooler, mm -hmm. um, well, the farther north you go, we always just got super winds or, you know, we reduced down to like a tropical storm. But as we've been seeing, um, a lot of these hurricanes were coming up here full force, I think beginning with Sandy. And then we've been seeing the, the impacts of others um, and floods and stuff all up in New Jersey, New York areas. And I'm like, yeah, um, this is because we're not built to handle these strong hurricanes like places like Florida and stuff like that. The architecture, the buildings. Uh, the homes are not built for those kind of strong winds and rains. Mm -hmm. um, we saw with the flooding not too long ago in New York, uh, people were dying, trapped in basements, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it was a very quick show. It wasn't like hours upon hours, how you have with some of these other places that are stuck in these massive hurricanes. It was just a, a few hours, four or five hours that caused that amount of damage. I'm just like, uh, and I was getting kind of scary. Um over here, yeah. uh, for sure. Because yeah. um, when I was driving up to Philadelphia, all of that was happening. And in, in the areas that I had to pass through, they had experienced some tornadoes. So it's like, child, I, cause I was going, I've been going back and forth with a friend who, you know, is on the job market and they're thinking about like all the places that they could live. And so like, you know, seeing this storm happen, they're like, oh, I don't know if I want to go down there. <laughs> and I was just like, well, don't throw too much shade because California is another. I'm like, don't throw too much shade because <laughs> California got wildfires and they got no water. And then when I look mm -hmm. up the wildfires, there are such things called fire tornadoes that happen in California. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, California get everything. I mean, they really don't get hurricanes which I'm sure they might appreciate a little bit, get some water. Um, yeah. But yeah, the dry, no water, the fire, the hurricanes, the earthquakes, like nah, Cali. Cali's nice. The weather nice all year round, but you got to do a lot of other stuff. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'm like, look, let's not get into a region war and like, throw too much shade because girl, I make you feel yeah, some nah. type of way about where you about to move. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder. I know there's got to be some kind of maybe some meteorology. Got to be like some some place. Uh, it's like the safest weather states or something along those lines. Idaho. That exists. Idaho probably. <laughs> probably. I could. No, I wouldn't. But you know, if enough of our people start migrating over there, you know, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. Um, but yeah, those there's those, a lot of those states south the Dakotas and Idaho and everything <laughs> that I know don't come up on a lot of folks' radar. Yeah. That probably have generally safer, safer elements. I think they, they probably still get tornado because it's just all of that. I feel like mm -hmm. in the mid, Flatline. yeah, I feel like that's where tornado, like in, in Peoria, we actually have used to have like tornado warnings and what I never, I'll be honest, I never took you seriously, but I should have, I should have because Illinois is one of those places. 
<laughs> yeah, this. I mean, at school in Indiana, Purdue, them uh, alarms used to go off in them store. I remember my first year there. I was like, what? What is these sirens going off for? Mm-hmm. You know, me, me coming from Jersey, never hearing anything like that. And things coming off when the storms come. And then you get the little alerts like, please go indoors. Please go indoors. I'm like, oh, not as serious. Yeah, go into some of those uh-huh. Purdue tunnels. Oh yeah, them tunnels. Yeah, yeah. They had a good system of of tunnels underneath to really protect people from the snow. But definitely, if there were hurricanes, I mean hurricanes, tornadoes and stuff, you could definitely go down there. So mm-hmm. it made sense. It's funny, but yeah, yeah. No, nah, it's real, real. Gotta consider this stuff now because of climate change. Hopefully, we can find ways to reverse it. Um, another uh, story that I think is interesting. Um, well, another kind of big story was that. The Supreme Court decision on abortion, uh, that's pretty much they decided to let Texas continue that abortion law, uh, but kind of added some glimpse of a hope to providers. Because remember, with this law, folks can sue the providers if they allow abortions at their facilities, folks that have nothing to do with the abortions. And um so the Supreme mm-hmm. Court said that providers are allowed to actually sue back. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, so it wasn't like completely shut down. It's like there's they're completely helpless of folks who are fighting against it, but they're still disappointed. A lot of the activists and advocates that were pushing for them to really shut down this law, Supreme Court and it didn't do it, but they also said this is now not a one-way street of folks just suing the providers, that the providers can also come back at these folks mm-hmm. Um, so because the door is still open, many folks feel like now other states are going to continue to move forward. However, it's not completely shut down. It does go back down to the district courts to uh, continue. The fight continues. It's not over just because it went to the Supreme Court. They made this ruling. And of course, uh, folks like Sotomayor and others dissented, has some pretty good dissenting uh, remarks. Um, but, you know, it's still we didn't get the outcome that we we're hoping for of just allowing uh, women to control their bodies, right? And these states still doing what they can do to fight against abortion. Yeah, you know, it, this that is so interesting that they still allow that to, you know, remain in place that you can actually sue a provider. But you know, the everyday citizen probably needs to be a little bit careful if they, you know, kind of want to go after like maybe you know, these big clinics or even providers that may have more money to like make their life a headache. Um, Because if I was in that circumstance and you sued me, yes, I would be real petty and we gonna stay in court and I might have more resources than you to like make it hurt. So better Mm -hmm. be careful Mm -hmm. who you decide to sue. (laughs) You gotta gotta be careful and it's really worth all that money. Um, You know, for folks just making decisions about their own bodies. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Uh, states, you know, there's been conversations about what this kind of new Roe v. Wade life would look like. Uh, many Democratic states are saying, hey, we're not taking part in this. In fact, California said, the governor said, yeah, uh, Newsom said we're going to be a safe haven for folks seeking abortion. So, you know, we'll, you could come here. You can still do what you want, would like to do, even coming from other states. So, you know, you said we're keeping our doors open. Uh, but reading, you know, other experts said, hey, that's a privilege mm-hmm. thing, um, you know, because you got to have money to travel to a completely different state. And so they're saying what's probably going to happen is that folks who have money and want abortions will still be able to get abortions. And this is going to be largely a big impact on folks who and women who are poor or don't have a lot of money um, because, you know, resources are going to be shut down. It is going to be more expensive if you have to travel. And so we're probably going to see the biggest impact with that population. Yeah, agreed. That, I mean, that's how it was like in, in the past. Like, cause I don't I feel like there are just some states that have always just made it like really difficult. Maybe the clinics are like very far away from each other. Like thinking about Texas where traveling even in another city across the state could be like three or four hours as if you're traveling to another state. So that's always been an issue and it's just going to be exacerbated. Mm-hmm. 100. 100. Um, so, yeah, you know, we'll keep our eyes and ears open, see what comes about from this. But things like this, decisions like this, the way the Supreme Court plays it, you know, we already see, in our, see our country being divided politically in so many different ways. And I think this uh, increases the division <laughs> a lot more. Uh, because now you're going to have red states, 
you know, go one direction with this and blue states go in a completely different direction. And this is why it's important for federal mandates and statutes, because it creates, you know, parameters. So everyone is at least reasonable and humane and compassionate in their approach to certain laws. And so now when you kind of remove those regulations, we're going to see these things play out in, in extreme ways, depending on where you live and could be a scary sight, right? If we keep moving in that direction of being so divided with policy and our government afraid to just do what's, to do what's right. There are just some things that should be universal about human rights and ability to control yourself, especially in a country that says freedom is, you know, our foundational element. And now you're removing freedom from, from women. Um, that's not, to me, upholding the values of this country, mm-hmm. right? But this is not the first time we've seen mm-hmm. these inconsistencies and, and hypocrisy, et cetera. Uh, but we'll see. I don't think anything good is going to come out of these these kind of policies. Agree, agree. Um, and another kind of quick story. I know we reported on um this before. You reported on this before about um. Well, I think actually this is a different black couple. So I think the one you really talked about before was in Indiana. So I think there's a couple of stories coming about where home of black homeowners are, are, you know, appraising their home. It's undervalued. Have a white person do it mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. it gets more money. And so there's a black couple in California who was filing a housing discrimination lawsuit um, that, you know, an appraiser lowballed them because of their race because they did something similar. Um, they appraised it themselves. And refinance it was nine hundred and ninety five thousand dollars. And then I think when a white person did it, it went to one point four million. Oh, wow. Look at that. A five hundred thousand dollar difference. Um, And so, again, I think these even when you talked about it before, it was a a massive amount. And so I think, you know, why they probably going to have a case because these are these discrepancies are huge. It wouldn't be huge if it was like. Five ten thousand dollars, but you're talking half a million dollar difference because of who showed. That is uh, alarming, and that definitely needs to be addressed. And there's definitely some form of discrimination, and so um, they're fighting this um, uh, as they should. And hopefully, if you know if this goes up the chain and becomes a a bigger issue, a Supreme Court issue, or some different rulings, and you know, and there should be some regulations and some standards put in place of of trying to remove bias from these approval approval ratings. Yeah, that is wild. Even at that level, since it's such an expensive home, I think they probably could have even got away with like $50,000. Like, like, you know what I'm saying? Like $50,000 mm-hmm. here or there, like some things, but $500,000, that is a huge difference. And it just goes to show if I ever sell a home in the future, uh, I'm going to be calling on my uh, white friends. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Got to take down all the photos, and you and John, <laughs> and uh, and yeah, make it uh, make it so they really believe you're white. Uh, but that's sad. It's sad. This is the, this is the, the world. You know, the world of being black in America, and this stuff still exists. Um, and I'm glad more folks have been sharing their stories. And I'm glad news, the news media, has been picking this up. So now we can uh, see the trend, and folks say, "Hey, oh, you know this." This happened to me too. And this happened to, I know somebody else. And then this is how you began to build stronger cases in a movement to, to correct these things. Cause again, this is one of the biggest things that are used to keep us uh, from gaining yeah, wealth. Yeah, this right? is, uh, housing is one of the issues that, you know, maintains the black white wealth gap. And so if you are potentially missing out on hundreds of thousands of dollars, that could be used to, either buy a more expensive home or even pay off debt or even like what, like that's a lot of money. Yep. Yep. That's a lot. And where was this again? What, where was this again? It was in California. California. Mm-hmm. It was in California. Uh, for, I'll be mad. Half a million dollars. Like, like 990,000. Like, and that first person intentionally kept it under a million dollars. And then this next appraiser said it's worth well over a million dollars, you know, 1.5 million like, that's just wild. <laughs> that's too big of a discrepancy. And you're robbing us out of half a million dollars because of your racism. Um, nope. You're going to have to pay for that. You're going to have to pay for that. I wish these news media outlets would also, I don't know if, I don't know, maybe there's some kind of regulations, but I feel like these appraisers or whatever companies they work for need to be uh, addressed. Like, I need to hear those names because um, I need these companies to know there's ramifications that if this is found out that you're going to lose 
your reputation is going to take a big hit, if anything. And maybe you can uh, get legal legal consequences as well. But a lot of times when I read these stories, I never hear about the, the names of those appraisers or those appraisal companies or who's doing it. Um, and that's important. Um, and I think along those lines, I think one of the last stories I have um, is that this recent report came out. Um, I was reading on Politico that... Um, that nine out of 10 cities with the most black residents saw significant black flight over the last two decades. Um, so the, the, these cities are New York, Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Los Angeles, Memphis, Washington, DC, and New Orleans. The only city in the top 10 that had an uptick was Houston and Houston, Texas. And all these other states have uh, cities have, uh, saw a decrease in black residents since the year 2000. Mm, I wonder what's driving that. Yeah, not sure. Um, I think I, I can say at least for the Northeast, definitely cost of living because I have so many people like, again, my parents, my brothers and cousins and aunts are like so many people uh, migrated from here to Georgia, to Atlanta. Um, and so I wonder what Atlanta's numbers are. I am pretty sure they have been seeing a, a, a massive uptick um, even what we saw this past election cycle, now Georgia pretty much flipped. I think that has a lot to do with a lot more black folks moving out there. Um, so I do want to see like kind of the opposite, the states that are having an uptick of black migrants coming in. Um, but yeah, I just think that a part of it has to do with the economic um, area. I know, but also some places have saw a decrease economically, like places like Detroit and stuff like that. Uh, with, you know, the, the factories and the housing, uh, not the housing, the factories being closed and the cars and stuff like that, those kind of jobs leaving then folks to leave. So all these kind of things, I think this, the place that had the biggest, yeah, Detroit, uh, Detroit, 277,000 decrease. Um, and then Chicago was after that 261,000. Um, so, so a lot to be probably can explain those things, but I just thought that, uh, it's important to see that these historically chocolate cities are now becoming less, a little less chocolatey. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe that will, you know, spell changes for how other cities are operating now that uh, we'll have some of that chocolate flavor in other places. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, now this is interesting because when I hear, I've heard like um, many, many of the folks on The Breakfast Club, like Envy and, uh, and Angela Yee, like for the past couple of years, they just been talking because they've been into like real estate investing and rental properties and they just keep ha talking about, oh, it's, the market is great in Detroit. The market is great in Detroit. And I think it's for reasons like this. This is, I think, a consequence that's about to happen. Like these families who probably are moving out because there's not enough happening or losing their homes. Now you're going to see these investors come in and, and then pick these com pick these communities back up and, and raise the value. Right. Um, and see this as an opportunity to make more money. I'm just like, wow, why can't this, why can't these things happen when folks are, are there and struggling and folks still look at this as an opportunity to uh, help folks out or, or, or make money, et cetera. Um, so I think a lot of these places are probably going to folks with money are going to wind up flipping these places and gentrify them. And then it's going to be a different Detroit, mm -hmm. you know, a, a different Very Chicago so. in certain areas. Very much so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we will see, but I thought that was just important worth mentioning um, that, you know, some black flights are happening in some of the major cities with large black populations. And I think, you know, we'll see what kind of consequences this have. Again, I, I do think though, like I said, what we've seen in Georgia, we may see in other places, places that are seeing an uptick and um, the black population, if they're especially going to red places or red areas, how that will change the political landscape of voting and things like that. And I think Georgia was definitely a prime example of us seeing something like that. And I wonder if that happened in other places. We'll, we'll see, only time will tell, um, but okay. Um, any other stories that on your end? Uh, um, you know, those, those were, uh, most of my stories, um, uh, that I shared before just, you know, it's a lot going on in any given week. Mm -hmm. Uh, just, just mm -hmm. have to say that, but hopefully as we go into the new year, uh, we can have some, mm -hmm really good yes lord news or something like that <laughs> hopefully 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 we'll see um uh, how you feel about your boy uh juicy smoye oh goodness <laughs> all, the, all the memes have been so funny um yeah 
I guess, you know, he shouldn't have lied. You know, I didn't completely follow the case, but I I knew from like the very beginning, like when they first were thinking about charging him, like was that last year? It seemed like five years ago, but I'm guessing it was probably just last year. So I knew it was January 2019. So it's almost okay. Okay, well, I get three years ago. Yeah, wow. Um, so I I I was right because my time and has been off, but yeah, it was a few years ago. So it was just surprising to hear that he was, they were still moving forward with this, but based on like all the evidence presented before, it was clear that like uh, something in the milk wasn't clean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm mad he, st- he really stuck with this lie all this time. Like all this wasn't going to come come about. All, I didn't follow it too closely, but I saw a couple of things like, yeah, he was dating one of the guys. And so that other guy was his brother and, you know, he, he paid them. He, he gave them food. He told them what to do. And, you know, they like fake punched him and all this other kind of stuff. It was like they went through all the details of, of how it happened. Um, and so, yeah, I know most folks suspect it was a lie, but he was saying it wasn't. That we're going to see the truth. And he got found guilty in four out of five counts of disorderly conduct. Each of those counts can go to a maximum of three years. I think twenty five thousand dollar fine. Um, I think the judge is saying, you know, they're going to deliberate and figure out what the penalty will be. So there's a potential he might get jail time. I feel like he might just because he put, you know, everybody's tax dollars through all this extra, uh, using a lot of resources for this case of him lying. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it'd be three years, maybe a few months, if anything, a few weeks or an extensive fine. We'll see that that's to be determined. But that was just worth mentioning. Yeah, you said three years ago he was lying. Yeah. I know it was a, a big, big headline when all this stuff did occur. I just, uh, for I sure. do wonder, will his career recover, or is kind of like, dude, you done? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a he becomes a liability now. Uh, when you do something so extensively like this, you're not a victim, and you're uh, concocting this whole story. Um, yeah, it's like, can we fully trust you as talent? Uh, can we trust your word? Can we believe you? Are you going to do something else wild? And now we have to recast. I think people would be taking a lot of chances on him. Um, But I'm sure there's going to be some opportunity out there because his name probably will bring some views. It just depends on the content or something. We'll see. Nowadays, everybody can get a reality show. So maybe you start. Yeah, you know what? Yeah. Rebrand your image. Yeah, (laughs) it's going to be a reality show to recap. Yeah. And then he's going to bring the drama. And then all of a sudden, it'll be all over. Look at you. You need to Mm -hmm. go. You need to be a publicist. You need to sell that strategy to him. Uh, I miss my calling. I miss my calling, huh? Uh, Too funny. Uh, But okay. A lot of of interesting stories. Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, So we'll catch y'all again next week. Um, if you haven't yet, follow us on social media at PhD Podcast is our social media handle. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can visit us on our website, blackandhighlydangerous.com, the queue of all our latest content. You can also email us, bhdpodcast at gmail.com. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, ideas, guests, things you'd like to see us cover, hit us up. We'd love to hear from you all. And after you do that, please go ahead and review and rate us on iTunes. That helps us out with the algorithms so more people can find us. So please, please take some time to do that really quickly. It really is immense help. And after you do that, share us with your friends, share us with your family, and share us with your enemies. And as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear. If you're interested in continuing this and other conversations, visit our website, blackandhollydangerous.com to subscribe to our email list, suggest topics, and participate in our discussion forums. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at BHD Podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe and rate our podcast on your favorite platform. And as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear.